This year's theme of the CSW climate change is also strongly intertwined with SRHR. Asia and the Pacific region is at the forefront of experiencing the impact of climate change and the resulting disasters. Studies by Aero and partners in the region reveal the disproportionate impact of climate change on women, young people and non-binary persons. The impact of climate change is not gender neutral. Existing structural and social inequalities of which gender inequality is foremost are amplified during climate change and climate disasters. The capacity and vulnerability of women and girls vary depending on age, ethnicity, marital and socio-economic status, minority status and educational levels. In particular, sexual and reproductive health and rights deteriorate further in the context of climate change. A reversion to early age marriage, a rise in sexual and gender-based violence, increase in care burden at the household level are realities for women and girls. Even the key SRHR services, contraceptive, safe abortion services, maternal health and delivery services, comprehensive sexuality education are largely missing in the current environment and climate discourses. The gender specific needs of women and young people in all our diversities to adapt and build resilience to climate change have been deprioritized. In this, we would also like to emphasize the work of the Action Coalition to adopt an intersectionality approach and look at climate change in close comparison with SRHR. Climate change is a real threat that we are living every day in our bodies and in our territories. Especially when you're speaking from Latin America perspective from the global south. We young leaders of the Feminist Coalition for Climate Justice understand that our sexual and reproductive rights are seriously affected in the moment of crisis and environmental disasters, rights that we are conquered with a lot of struggle and hard work. This moment of crisis affect the education and the development of a thousand of girls that in these circumstances are the first victims of extremely vulnerabilities. It's complex to talk about, even more so in the face of the youth that we can no longer may be invisible anymore and put at risk how we can protect these people and how we can protect ourselves and prepare for a certain future. And at the same time, certain in that extreme climate events will be more frequent. We need to think about the youth girls and young women and human rights that are put at risk with the decisions that are being made today. For example, it's known that maternal mortality increase in natural disasters, as well as the fact that the girls and women are less likely to have proper medical care in the case of forced displacement caused by climate change. In addition, according to UN data, girls and women are 14 times more likely to die in disasters caused by climate change. Therefore, people who are capable of generation life should have a choice over their own bodies. The right to a safe and healthy environment for women are human rights that must be guaranteed by decision makers. In this regard, what adaptive measures are being taken in disseminating our society? We see news every day talking about high temperatures, deforestation, droughts, floods, and emissions, and we fail to see measures that government and companies are taking to prepare us for a future of food and water insecurity and human rights affected. In this scenario, we hope that in the final agreement coming out of CS-066, the intersection between climate crisis and reproductive rights will be taken into consideration by world leaders. Let me add my voice to this discourse and specifically talk about some of the climate crises that have happened across Africa and uh, some of their effects and how best we can also uh, be part of this discussion. Of course, sharing our voices and sharing our knowledge with some of the first responders, the first line of uh, responders during climate emergencies. Um, across Africa, severe droughts have been witnessed and these have been uh, widely reported. We've also had floods uh, that have claimed multiple, of li uh, multiple lives. Uh, we've also had cases of conflict that are caused by scarce natural resources. 
And why do we tie this to the climate uh, crisis? This is because some of the scarcity of these resources are occasioned by the climate uh, crisis, uh, the climate injustices for, uh, for lack of a better term. And so we see people uh, fighting for scarce resources like pasture, like water, uh, minerals, and so on and so forth. And this is this is this all ties up to this discussion. Now, specifically mirroring or narrowing down our lens to the sexual and reproductive uh, health and rights of girls. Of course, tying it to the broader discussion around uh, the intersection between the climate justice, bodily autonomy, and uh, uh, climate emergencies. What exactly should we call out? Number one, I would wish to talk about humanitarian aid. How much money is appropriated or is allocated to humanitarian aid? And then the second question is, how much money how much out of the money that is allocated to humanitarian aid, how much money actually goes to support sexual and reproductive health products? We're talking about contraception, talking about sanitary pads, we're talking about clean water and sanitation. Moving on from humanitarian aid, let's also talk about legal frameworks and policies that support neutrality of women, especially when they're transitioning, when they're in transition, when maybe they're fleeing the conflict areas. How are the legal, what are the legal frameworks that can safeguard uh, their lives and when they access maybe healthcare or some of these products from from neighboring countries, assuming maybe they flee into an, into other areas, how best can they be supported in order to access uh, these products that we are talking about? And last but not least, I will not end this uh, this discourse without mentioning awareness creation and use of technology and social media to create awareness and build sensitization. If women and girls are sensitized and know what kind of information that they should look out for or where they can access some of these uh, products and services, even in the other countries that they, uh, that, 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 they, that they take refuge in, then it will be very easy for them to, to, to have access to some of these products that we are talking about. And so there is a very significant power in technology, in social media that can be harnessed to also support this. And I want to call out specifically young people, young women, young girls uh, to specifically ensure that they use that which is at their disposal to ensure that many other women and girls have clear, concise and reliable information around sexual and reproductive health and rights. Good day to you all. My name is Akansha and I'm a youth activist from India. It is an honor to have this important opportunity to share this platform with you all. When we talk about climate change, we often talk about innovative technological solutions and policies to reduce carbon emissions. Links between gender and climate change is often overlooked. Evidence suggests that climate change has a gender vulnerability and climate emergencies amplify the already existing societal inequalities in the lives of women and girls. In my region and beyond, women face discrimination in all aspects of their lives. Given existing gender inequalities and development gaps, climate change disproportionately affects women and girls. Living and working in a developing country, I have witnessed firsthand the impacts of climate change. Growing up in a small village in Uttar Pradesh, India, where the majority population predominantly depended on agriculture for occupation and income, adverse impacts of climate change forced us to migrate. Not every woman and girl from my village has been privileged like me. They had to give up their education in order to take care of their families and younger children. Nearly 4 million people, the majority of which are women, die every year from illnesses associated with indoor air pollution, as women do most of the domestic work. It is estimated that women and girls in developing countries spend more than 20 hours a week collecting water and fuels. We are living in uncertain times where with war and displacement being a reality. It is estimated that, that about 80% of the displaced population worldwide consists of women and children. And in conflict settings, they face an increased vulnerability to physical and sexual abuse when leaving their communities and refugee camps to collect fuel and water. Energy poverty and time poverty reduces women's ability to take advantage of economic opportunities. 
In the end, I urge you all to continue this action on climate change and gender equality. Keep working together. Ensure that the decisions made are not just transformative, but are inclusive, transparent and participatory. It is our issue. We all need to play our part. We need to keep raising our voices against injustice, not just at home, but also where we work, when we vote, and when we represent ourselves and on organ and our organizations on platforms like these. There's an urgent need for collaboration and action from all. That's the only way to bring about a real lasting change in a gender equal way. My name is Julia Monroe. And my name is Massimo Perrino. And we are from the United Cities and Local Governments World Secretariat. While all people and living things have the right to care, dignity, and the opportunity to thrive, in times of disaster and crises, groups such as women and children, the LGBTQI plus community, older persons, those with disabilities, migrant populations, and ethnic minorities are disproportionately impacted and are the first to see their rights compromised. In this way, the climate emergency is deeply gendered this gendered experience is further shaped by a diversity of contexts and identities, rendering women and marginalized groups particularly vulnerable to climate impacts. For example, many rural women farmers in the global south rely on small scale produce for their livelihoods and shifts in climate are radically impacting their opportunities, highlighting the urgency for their experiences to be heard their leadership potential to be recognized and for urban rural linkages to be strengthened. And yet, such populations remain underrepresented in political leadership and governance processes across the globe and continue to be the target of violence, systemic discrimination and disinformation. The participation of women and feminist leaders in decision making is not only core to the democratic process. It is key to enabling governance with empathy and to prioritizing the public in direct response to the diverse needs and aspirations for communities. For this reason, we need a shift in leadership. As such, the active participation of diverse women and girls in all levels as equal stakeholders in our societies needs to be a pillar upon which we build a new social contract to safeguard our livelihoods, protect our global commons, and mitigate the climate crisis together. My name is Samantha Swanda and um, I come from Harare, Zimbabwe. It's really nice to connect with you. I work in the area of disability. My organization is called Signs of Hope Trust. I'm also the program manager of a program that's under the Spotlight Initiative in Zimbabwe with the Disabled Women Support Organization. There are a lot of challenges that I see with regards to body autonomy, with regards to the equality uh, of people with disabilities uh, to other people. It has really been a sad situation that we note um, of the challenges that women with disabilities face. We have seen, due to climate change, the increase of disasters, for example, cyclones, uh, floods and all that. All these disasters, they need persons with disabilities to be evacuated from where they are. It has really been a sad situation because for people with mobility challenges, people have to evacuate them and it's really not safe for them. They are lifted and they are held in other places that are really not comfortable with them. We have seen people even in the transportation being lifted up into quite a lot of transportation and they are, they are really not comfortable. It has really been sad to know that the evacuation methods that are there do not suit everybody. So in some mitigation issues and challenges, uh, as we mitigate all these challenges, we wish that they can be safe evacuation methods, especially for people who have got uh, mobility challenges. Also, when you look at the evacuation sites, it's really, really difficult for people with mobility challenges because you'll see that um, even when you note the campsites that are placed, for evacuation of the people. They are not accessible. Persons with disabilities fail to access water. They fail to access clean facilities for them. And that is a really big SRHRA issue for them. So when we are talking about mitigation expectations, we expect to see persons with disabilities being in the committees that are set up for response to climate change situations.
situations and in response to disaster. I know that our Ministry of Social Development has already started to do these things, but we really wish to see all these committees that are formed to mitigate climate change, having persons with disabilities representing themselves. Women with disabilities have to bear double burden of discrimination, that is their gender and disability. When you talk about disability, it is also systematic nature of problems rather than disability itself that may add to the complexities. There are multiple layers of vulnerabilities and marginalizations within women with disabilities own community. And this increased higher during any disaster or any climate change situations. Protection violence against women and girls with disabilities and specific issues regarding sexuality, access to information and services would therefore differ across the kinds of disability as well as the context of disaster or the geographic location, etc. The professional's negative attitude, unavailability of sanitary napkin and required medicine causes other type of suffering to girls and women with disabilities. Some of other challenges from stigma and social acceptance causes more difficulties in shelter room or own community due to disaster. They may cause huge suffering as a result of women with disabilities developed different sexual and reproductive disease because not to get in accessible scope to maintain a proper hygiene during disaster. Communication system become very poor so that they cannot even ask for any cooperation from anyone, even from family. And also increase dependency to others for regular life maintenance. I am Reesu Dakar, President of UWA. UWA is a youth-led youth-run organization in Nepal working with dynamic issues of young people including sexual and reproductive health and rights. UWA participated in the Generation Equality Forum last year as a participant, panelist and commitment maker where we seek to amplify youth-led advocacy efforts for comprehensive sexuality education and ensuring young people's sexual and reproductive health and rights at the national level through the building of young people's capacity from across the country on various aspects of SRHR and creating a physical and digital platform to demand the integration of CSE into the curriculum for both in and out of school settings and its effective implementation. Our commitment also contributes to the issues around intersections between SRHR and climate crisis and related disasters. As a young person myself in the field of public health, I understand the disproportionate impact of climate change on young people. And our works at UWA have been around the space as where we lead discussions around the same, consult with young people regarding their experiences on climate change. One of the major impacts of climate change related disasters on young people is on their access to sexual and reproductive health and rights. Incidences such as school dropouts and early child and forced marriages, especially for young girls in the aftermath of disasters, denies them access to comprehensive sexuality education and further increases the risk of early pregnancy, which makes the girls more susceptible to placental tears, obstruction at the time of delivery, and maternal mortality. Our work towards our commitment to GEF therefore also contributes to address this issue. UWA has been currently leading the youth movement for generation equality in Nepal, where we are collaborating with the national systems and governments to provide them with the support they need in making a commitment for themselves, especially on the sector of contraceptives and safe abortion, comprehensive sexuality education, and patriarchal violence. We are overwhelmed to share with you all that our movement is making loud noises and we are being heard at various levels of the government with an incredibly positive response. Distinguished participants, friends, ladies and gentlemen, 
from Napanini Melody. Greetings to you all. My name is Noma Eating, and I am the executive director of the Kiribati Family Health Association in Kiribati. The global headlines recently, Kiribati is highly vulnerable and is to be swallowed by sea level rise because of climate change. At this time, I would like to extend my thanks to the organizers and facilitators of the, the CSW 66 side event and for the opportunity to allow me to contribute in this very important session. The topic is on achieving gender equality and the empowerment of all women and young girls in the context of climate change and environmental disaster risk reduction policies and programs. In the Pacific region, including Kiribati, are exposed to various natural hazards and environmental disasters. This includes king tides, volcanic eruptions, flooding, strong storms, drought, etc. The impact of this natural disaster goes beyond the direct impact on our ecosystem, disruption to our environment. It goes beyond and impacted our social, health, political and economic development. The impact of climate disaster and climate change affected our life and our economy in the Pacific. And these are further exacerbated because of the climate change. In regard to the Sustainable Development Goals 2030, sexual and reproductive health are often overlooked and uh, under budgeted. This is why it might be difficult to achieve the vision and goal of the SDG 2030, which is to leave no one behind and most importantly, to protect and to improve the general welfare, health of all women, children and adolescents. I would like to close this statement on behalf of all Pacific MAs. I would like to call on all comments to ensure that sexual reproductive health and rights are included in their national plans and also in the humanitarian response plans. I also would like to take this opportunity and call on all the women at this time to stand up and to take action. And let's join together to become very responsible to our own issues. And let's start working on it from our own families. To join hands together in this, in this effort, we will be able to make a change. Thank you. The Maori, the Roy, and the Dagmar.